Hello, my name is Dr. Catherine McGill, and I'm here with Professor Clifford Will at the University of Florida, and today we're going to talk about the history of general relativity. Thank you so much for joining me today, Clifford. Oh, my pleasure. So I was thinking, actually, before we talk about general relativity, we go back to Newton a little bit. And you know, in the 1680s, he's developed his law of gravitation, and this was a huge accomplishment. And for a while, it took care of everything. When did the cracks start to appear in uh, Newton's formulation of gravity? And the need for an expanded view was kind of on the horizon. Well, the first crack appeared uh, in around uh, the 1850 period, 1853 or so, when a French astronomer and uh, mathematician named uh, uh, Urbain Le Verrier, who was director of the Paris Observatory at the time, he was examining the orbit of Mercury, studying the data that had been accumulated on Mercury. and it turns out that Mercury's orbit, which is an, an ellipse, rotates very slowly. Okay. It's about uh, 500 arc seconds per century, very tiny amount. But it was measured rather easily by astronomers. And using Newton's theory of gravity, which had been extraordinarily successful, the very assumed that this, per this motion was induced by the perturbing effect of all the other planets. Okay. And so we set out to calculate all those effects. It's a lot of added, things to calculate. Added them up. <laughs> it was, by today's standards, it was a remarkable piece of work, all done by hand, oh my gosh. by candlelight. I mean, this is the 1850s, oh right? Uh, we didn't have mathematical software to no do computers. it. These were, <laughs> these were complicated calculations. But he, he did them, added up all the results from each planet, from Earth, Venus, Saturn, uh, Jupiter, and so on. But the answer was 43 arc seconds per century short of the observed amount. And he could not figure out, he checked and checked his calculations, they were correct. So there was a discrepancy between what Newton's theory predicted and what was observed. And for the next 50 years, nobody could explain this discrepancy. Was that the only discrepancy for that 50 years, or did other that things was, start? That was the main thing. The I main mean, thing, yeah. there were other some other issues arose, but they were all explained within Newtonian theory. Except for this one problem, Newtonian theory was one of the most successful theories sort of in the history of science wow. up until that point. It really explained everything, the tides of the Earth, the detailed details in the motion of the moon. Mm. But um, in this particular example, the precision of observations had gotten uh, good. so good yeah. that it could reveal this tiny discrepancy. People, including Le Verrier, proposed maybe there's a planet between Mercury and the Sun. Okay. And if you gave this planet the right mass and the right orbit, its perturbation of Mercury could account for 43 arc seconds. So astronomers went out to try to search for this planet orbiting the Sun, but within Mercury's orbit. There are many claimed sightings, but none of them held up uh, over time. And by the turn of the 20th century, uh, this problem remained. No one could explain this wow. discrepancy. And um, that planet was called Vulcan, was that right? They called it Vulcan okay. because it would have to be a, a very hot. <laughs> it was named after the Roman <laughs> god of fire. Um, but again, uh, there was no observational evidence of it, confirmed evidence, uh, as of, say, uh, early part of the 20th century when Einstein was starting to think about okay. his own theory of gravity. So what prompted Einstein to take up this thinking about gravity and I mean maybe it was just this discrepancy and he was interested in that problem. Mercury was not the motivation for his theory of gravity. The motivation was his earlier development of special relativity in okay. 1905. So this theory accounted for the fact that the speed of light seemed to be the same to all observers and so he developed a framework that allowed us to understand uh, observers in relative motion right. that, that, that verified the really allowed you to understand why the speed of light was the same, why there was no evidence of a of a medium that light would propagate through. It, mm -hmm. Every observer would measure the same speed of light, and it really gave a beautiful accounting of that. And then it had many other uh, uh, side predictions, such as E equals m c squared, the right. equivalence between mass and energy, and um, and although it took a long time for it to be the theory to be fully understood and, and for many experiments to really verify special relativity, mm -hmm. today it's the complete foundation of all of modern physics. Oh, I mean, when I was in grad school, the first day of our electricity and magnetism class was the speed of light is constant. Let's derive Maxwell's equations. 
<laughs> it was pretty incredible. That's right. And, you know, and, and now it just underlies everything from quantum mechanics to, to high energy physics. I mean, it's really, we wouldn't have modern physics without special relativity. But Einstein realized after, within a year or two, that uh, uh, special relativity relies upon uh, thinking and observing in inertial frames, mm -hmm. frames that are sort of freely, freely falling, that you know, move without changing their velocity, and you compare frames moving with you know, constant velocity. But such frames don't exist on the Earth, right? right? You drop something, it accelerates. Right. And so he immediately realized he would have to generalize special relativity mm -hmm. to take into account gravity, because okay. gravity naturally causes things to accelerate. So, so special relativity on its own wouldn't quite take care of the acceleration part of the universe, essentially. Or, uh, part of yeah. acceleration you of had space. to imagine yourself way far away from any planets or galaxies mm -hmm. where inertial frames really would be move with constant speed. Okay. Uh, but such th ideas would not work near the Earth. And so really around two, 1907, he s started confronting how to incorporate gravity into special relativity, how to mesh these two ideas together. And that uh, turned out to, to be a very difficult problem. It took him another eight years. Wow. He finally got it in 19, uh, uh, 1915. Um, so difficult, I mean, it nearly killed him, but in the last oh year gosh. or so, working on general relativity, he grew very sick. Oh, wow. Uh, because, uh, partly because he wasn't eating well, he was staying up late. Kind of obsessively thinking about this problem. Obsessively thinking. Of course, it was also the middle of the First World War in Germany. There were blockades. There was, you know, I not a lot of food. To get science done he was also conditions. going through a divorce of his first wife. So it was a, it was a very difficult time for him. Yeah. Um, and then the, but in the end of the day, in, in November 1915, he presented this final theory. And is this when I've heard that Einstein had a happiest thought? Is this getting to that point in his life? So actually, the happiest thought really occurred in, in, uh, back in 1907, oh, okay. when he appreciated the fact that if you forget about inertial frames and moving at the same velocity, mm -hmm. but now think about a freely falling frame. Okay. Take an elevator and just drop it in a gravitational field. Let it go. So you imagine that somebody inside that elevator would then feel no gravity. The person was kind of float. Right, his thought experiments he was so able to do. It was a thought experiment. But it's a pretty remarkable one, because this was long before the space age. Yeah. Right? Today, we were used to seeing astronauts in the point. space shuttle floating and with the you know, stuff floating around them. Um, but he could envision that idea of free fall, freely floating just by you know, thinking about it. That's pretty ridiculous, because I mean, certainly having grown up after the space age came, <laughs> came to life, and, and yeah, the idea of floating in space is like, oh yeah, of course you do. Why wouldn't you? That's right. <laughs> right. So it's, uh, that alone, I think, was pretty remarkable. But then he realized that it, if you observe things in such a frame, then you could invoke special relativity, mm. because all the windows are shut. You're floating freely. You take the, a ball and throw it. Mm -hmm. It moves in a straight line because it's falling freely along with you and You're along with the elevator. All together, yeah. So everything is like special relativity is valid in that frame. And so in particular, a light ray passing across your, this freely falling elevator would move in a straight line at constant speed because that's what special relativity tells you. But then if you turn the tables and put your elevator in free space mm -hmm. and put a rocket underneath. Again, this is before rockets, but you know, yeah. put a rocket and have this thing accelerate. Then this light ray passing through the rocket would appear to be deflected a bit toward the base of the rocket. Right. Because from your point of view, the light ray is moving straight, but you're going up faster and faster as the light ray is going across. So from your point of view, it appears to bend. But then he said, if you're in a rocket that's, with, that's accelerating, Surely that's the same as just sitting on the surface of the Earth. In the rocket, you feel gravity, or you can stand at the base of the rocket, yeah. just as on Earth. So on Earth, a light ray passing through a simple lab sitting at rest on Earth should also be bent. So somehow gravity ought to bend light. Which is kind of crazy. And this, that he this idea <laughs> he called the principle of equivalence, that, that there was an equivalence between gravity mm -hmm. and acceleration. So up to that point, that mapping hadn't really been fully uh, accepted? Is that the way it's It, it, it hadn't been fully thought through, and, yeah. and the consequences of it, no one had really 
thought about until Einstein, you know, really put his mind to it and was able to carry over what, of course, what he had developed in special relativity uh, to apply to these, these thought experiments. Of course. And that, that gave him a bit of a clue as to how to approach in bringing gravity and special relativity together to think about freely falling frames and accelerating frames and try to tie it together. Okay. The problem was developing the mathematics that would do that was very complicated. Right. It required him to learn a whole new branch of mathematics that had only been invented in the second half of the wow. 19th century, uh, called different, we, today we call it differential geometry, really understanding spaces of n dimensions, mm -hmm. curved spaces, curved spaces in more than two dimensions. Mm -hmm. We can understand the curved surface of a ball, right, but that's, that's a two-dimensional <laughs> surface. <laughs> but how do you understand <laughs> a curved three-dimensional space? Right. Well, people have worked this out, Riemann and others in the latter half of the uh, 19th century. Uh, mathematically, at least, it's hard to draw pictures of higher dimensions, but mathematically, they had worked it out. So I can kind of imagine Einstein, he's you know, doing his research essentially here and comes up against something where he doesn't know the math that he needs. So he goes off to learn all of that math and so that he can continue with these physics right. questions that he's interested in. Well, it turned out he had a very good friend, Marcel Grossman, who was a mathematician oh, nice. who knew this field. And so Mar Marcel Grossman helped Einstein learn this, what in those days was called Riemannian geometry. Okay. And uh, so the two of them worked together. And in fact, they worked and proposed a theory of gravity in 1912. Oh, wow. A kind of what they called a, a, a draft theory or a preliminary theory of gravity. Okay. Um, building on a curved, the idea of curved space time and so on. But th th there were two, several problems with the theory. It really didn't satisfy the criteria that Einstein wanted for a theory, but also it failed to give the correct perihelion of Mercury. It, mm. it, gave a, it didn't give 43 arc seconds per century, this discrepancy that was still around, right. but it gave some other value. And so that wasn't, that wasn't good. Yeah. I mean, he wanted a theory that would agree with the experiment. At that time, it was the only experiment that, that where he could yeah. apply the theory. Yeah. And so, uh, so it took him another three years of hard work during the privations of, of the World War and so on. Uh, then by this time, he was in Berlin. But finally, in 1915, he uh, had what he thought was the final theory. This okay. final version thought it was beautiful. It said, sorry? <laughs> elegant. <laughs> it was elegant. It satisfied all the various theoretical criteria that he wanted to impose. But then, um, I mean, this was literally done in real time because he had promised a series of four lectures on his new theory to the Prussian Academy of Sciences. This is in November of 1915. Okay. The trouble was, the theory was still not finished. Okay. So he was finishing aspects of the theory. These were weekly lectures. <laughs> From one week to the next, he was still finishing aspects of the theory. Oh, my goodness. Furthermore, he had heard that a mathematician named David Hilbert was himself very close to having what we today call general relativity, mm -hmm. approaching it from a more mathematical viewpoint. Right. And so he was very concerned that Hilbert would beat him to it. Um, and so he was working desperately to finish it off. But finally, I think it was in the second to last lecture, and just days before, he took this new theory and worked out the perihelion advance of Mercury, and it, it, it gave the 43 arc seconds oh per century. Gosh. And this is when he later wrote to a friend that he thought he was having a heart attack when he <laughs> finished the calculation because it was just it was so exciting. Yeah. And he, it really told him that this, this theory was the correct theory, this version. I love that story because I feel like we talk about Einstein being a genius and coming with the territory of genius is sort of, oh, you just know how to do things. And he worked incredibly hard to develop general relativity. And, and I love that, I mean, I don't love that it gave him a heart attack, but <laughs> it felt like it gave him a heart attack, but, um, but just the amount of work that went into developing it. A lot of work and, and dead ends. He made mistakes. He, you know, it, it was a real struggle. Yeah. And uh, he, uh, so it's a combination of sort of the, this, this tremendous insight and, and also combined with being able to think a little bit outside the box mm -hmm. because you're thinking differently from most other contemporaries. Right. Yet, uh, he really worked hard uh, to, to, uh, to finish this theory. And 
So it took him several, it took him almost half a year to recuperate. He was just really sick from this hard work. Yeah. And he wasn't, he really didn't recover his health to, for another six months or a year oh after goodness. that. So it was a really hard, hard struggle. He paid a price for the rest of us to yeah. enjoy his theory, Indeed. that's for Indeed. sure. Indeed. So is this when um, sort of the fairy tale of general relativity, I've, I've heard you say that there's sort of the fairy tale version of general relativity's history and right. uh, that it could kind of start with this discovery of the perihelion matching up with his theory. Um, there was that, and then, then of course, the, the, the next big event that, that occurred was that um, he, part of the, another, th another prediction of the theory was that light should be bent. Mm -hmm. It dovetailed with his earlier argument about accelerating elevators, mm -hmm. but when you really get the full theory, you learn that the bending of light by a body like the sun is actually twice double what you would get if you just argued on the basis of freely f accelerating elevators. Oh, okay. Um, because it turns out that uh, part of the effect is from just this acceleration type argument. Mm -hmm. But the other part of the bending is from the fact that space itself is warped near a body like the sun compared to space far away, which is f flat because you're away in a weaker, you know, weaker gravity environment. Mm -hmm. So what you think are straight rulers near the sun Actually are actually themselves bent a bit. Okay. And so it's really a combination of two effects that gives the full prediction. So we made this prediction of the bending of light. And then uh, in 1919, Arthur Eddington and, uh, put together two teams of astronomers to go and measure this effect during a total eclipse of the sun. Oh, that's convenient. <laughs> yeah, so we, you need an eclipse of the sun because you, you have to look at stars that are very close to the sun because the, the, the bending of light is strongest when the light passes right. close to the sun. Even then, it's only about a little under two arc seconds. And, and normally, you can't see that because the sun itself is. It's, it's <laughs> right, so you can't. So you have to wait for an eclipse of the sun. Mm. And, uh, and then you can really, you can actually see the sky goes really dark, really dark and you can see stars near the sun. Oh, cool. So the idea is you take a photograph of, this, of the eclipse with the stars there. Mm -hmm. Then you wait six months, either before or after the eclipse, take the same field of stars. And then compare the photographs, and the stars that are close to the sun get pushed away from the sun, apparently, by the bending. Mm. Stars further away don't get pushed so much. And so by comparing all the locations, you can then measure the bending and see if it agrees with Einstein's theory. OK. And so this eclipse was in May 1919. And by the way, there's a, I'll be going to a conference on the island of Principe, off the coast of Africa, and we'll be there exactly 100 years after Eddington's measurement. We'll oh, be there this, be so this fun. spring, May 19, 2019, mm -hmm. May 29, 2019, on the very island, on the very spot where he made, set up the telescopes to make these measurements. That's so uh, I'll be able to report, I'll have lots of photos to report back. But there's not uh, going to be an eclipse, afterward. is there? Sadly, no <laughs> eclipse on that same day, but you know, we can't have everything. Yeah. Um, so that was May 1919. It, in November, he finished the analysis of the data and reported to the uh, Royal Society of London that he, he had successfully measured the bending. He had agreed with Einstein's theory. And this, this was the, sort of the dawn of the newspaper age. And That's right. within a few days, there were headlines in newspapers from the London Times to the New York Times, worldwide sensation about how you know, Einstein had overthrown Newton. You know, the, <laughs> And only you know, a few people in the world understood this new theory, but it was obviously correct because it made stars move, blah, 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 blah. Wow. So he was the, kind of the first media superstar of the 20th century. Is it also kind of the dawn of scientific reporting on some level? I mean, I guess it's early perhaps, uh, perhaps, uh, but it was certainly the first, uh, probably as far as I know, really the first time such a th scientific thing had caused this kind of sensation. Yeah because it, you know, it was so exotic. It was also the end of the World War. People were tired of getting reports of all the deaths on the battlefield. So it was kind of a, a glimmer of something new and exciting. Positive. You know, and, yeah, yeah, positive, yeah. Uh, to open a new age, maybe. Yeah. So, um, so in some sense, that's, from the point of view of the public perception of, of the theory, that's kind of the fairy tale. He invented the theory, Eddington confirmed it, and it was sort of, the so success everything from, from there. Yeah, everything <laughs> was great from that from then on. Um, What's the actual story? Well, it's not quite quite that much of a fairy tale in that uh, it was soon realized, uh, first of all, that Eddington's measurements were very difficult. They were not very accurate. 
So people, it would be necessary to repeat the experiment uh, with uh, other eclipses around the world. And this was done during the 20s and 30s and 40s. The results were not that great. They weren't improved. Some results were even mildly disagreed with Einstein's mm. prediction. So mm. it wasn't a, wasn't a completely clear picture. Also, um, you soon realize this theory was extremely complicated. Very few people really could understand it, very mathematical and ab abstract. And it seemed, as far as anyone could tell, just to predict some very tiny corrections in Mercury's orbit, the <laughs> position of stars. They were so tiny, they would never have any practical impact. And so within a few years, uh, the theory kind of drifted off into the kind of backwater of normal physics and astronomy. Interesting. Because very few people worked on it, and it didn't seem to be terribly important. The main directions of physics during the, you know, the subsequent decades were toward quantum mechanics, atomic physics, nuclear physics, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, following the Second World War, all the technological applications of physics that had been developed, radar, right. atomic bombs, semiconductors, and so on. Right. Uh, so the whole thrust of physics went this way, and, and up here in an island was general relativity. <laughs> um, and so by the, you know, the, the late 1950s and early 1960s, it was really not a, considered to be a fit subject. Was it almost it. embarrassing to, con to, to confess that you were a gravitational phys well, or GR uh, physicist? Or <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a, an anecdote that was told to me by my PhD advisor, Kip Thorne, um, now He's one of now. the famous, <laughs> a very famous relativistic uh, theorist and astrophysicist. He was an undergraduate student at Caltech. He had been accepted to go to graduate school in Princeton. Okay. And a very famous Caltech astronomer told him under no circumstances to study general relativity <laughs> at Princeton because it will never, ever have any importance for physics or astronomy. Oh, that's great. <laughs> and luckily for him and for me, <laughs> he out. disregarded that advice. He studied, studied under John Wheeler at Princeton, who was then getting really interested himself in general relativity. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the, they became the pioneers of this new emergence of the subject. Okay, okay. So there was sort of a renaissance then of... Uh... There was a renaissance. And uh, it was also caused in part by the discovery in 1961 and to 63 of quasars. Okay. What is a quasar? These are, these are objects that we see almost to the edge of the observable universe. They're, many of them are at really great distances, but they emit enormous amounts of energy. Okay. They look almost like stars but, so, because they're very tiny, but they emit energy at rates that are just cannot be explained by normal processes. Okay. At, but e even then, back in the early 60s, people thought that, well, maybe general relativity might have a, something to do with this because people did know that there was this phenomenon of collapse there was this Schwarzschild singularity, wasn't fully understood, but there were some exotic things that general relativity predicted. Okay. Maybe that, you know, Einstein's theory has something to do with quasars. Today we, not, we understand that the fundamental uh, engine of quasars uh, is a supermassive black hole at the center of a very active and dense galaxy. Right. Um, and it took a long time to develop that full understanding, but in the 60s, that was suspected. So at the time, like black holes hadn't really been conceptualized yet. It Correct. Was just sort of, you mentioned the Schwarzschild radius of uh, just sort of this collapse. Something kind of collapses, and yeah. we don't quite understand. It wasn't. I mean, the, the the theoretical understanding of black holes was developed during the same period, the '60s okay. into the '70s. Then in the mid '60s, the discovery of uh, the cosmic background radiation mm -hmm. from the very early universe, the, the expanding Big Bang it's model sort of the, the universe. The general noise that's in the background of the sky, almost. Yep. Uh, clearly, Einstein's theory has something to do with cosmology, so that was another area. And then in 1967, the discovery of uh, pulsars, and soon the realization that a pulsar is a spinning neutron star, a star so dense that it's at the same density as atomic nuclei, and it, the gravitational field is so strong that you have to use general relativity to understand the structure of these objects. Right. So again, another system where GR might play a role. Yeah. So these things sort of combine to build up this momentum, this growth, growing interest in Einstein's theory, saying that it might play a role in 
you know, astrophysics. Very cool. So, so sort of there are these experimental discoveries and looking for a way to explain them, and everyone's mm -hmm. like, well, if we have general relativity back here, maybe, maybe it works and we can take a look at it. That's right. Give it a second chance. Right. So by the time I entered graduate school in 1968, I mean, general relativity is kind of on the cusp of really starting to become a hot, hot field. Yeah, yeah, that's so cool. So are we in another sort of renaissance right now at all with the um, discovery of LIGO and gravitational waves coming on board and that being another aspect of general relativity? Or is it still just the kind of a continuation of the momentum that we built up in the, the 60s and 70s? Well, I mean, to, to some extent, it's a, it's a continuation because this is built on the foundation of research that went on from the early uh, from the 70s up till the uh, you know 2000s right. when when LIGO started operating and, and discovered gravitational waves but i think there's something new and different about this this new era that we've begun mm -hmm. and that is the exploration of uh what some people call strong gravity strong gravity uh, most of the phenomena that that for example we could test uh, in general relativity involve weak gravitational fields okay looking in the solar system, the bending of light, Mercury's perihelion advance. Mm -hmm. you know, gravity is relatively weak in the solar system. Um, there was the beginnings of uh, looking at, at more at, um, uh, strong gravity phenomena when binary pulsars were discovered. Okay. These are binary systems that. that contain pulsars or neutron stars. So the gravitational field of the neutron star itself is strong, although the gravitational field between that the star and its companion is relatively weak. Mm -hmm. But by studying these orbits in really g very precise detail, mm -hmm. uh, one could really test kind of a combination of effects of general relativity, okay. strong field and weak field effects, with very high precision. Um, but another aspect that you would like to, to, to discuss or to explore to see if Einstein's theory is correct is the really strong field up close and personal near black holes. Right. And with the discovery of gravitational waves from merging black holes, we're now really be able, being able to do that. So cool. And it's not just looking at the strong field aspects. These are black holes coming very close to each other, emitting huge bursts of gravitational waves. Sort of like a picture in our, in our picture That's behind picture us. Picture here. <laughs> We're also looking at the dynamical aspects of gravity, because these are waves that are, you know, the, now space-time is really vibrating. Things are not moving slowly anymore. Things are moving near the speed of light. So we're really looking at the dynamical aspects of gravity. So it's really exploring Einstein's theory in regimes that we haven't been able to explore oh, before this. That's so exciting. And so I think this is going to be a big theme for the future, really using gravitational waves to, to explore uh, aspects of general relativity that we can now, now, finally explore. So um, you've mentioned a lot of the successes, you know, the experiments that backed up general relativity. Is there anything, any way in which general relativity has failed us, per se? Is strong gravity sort of a counterpoint to general relativity, or it's just an aspect of it? Do we have any issue, issues with the theory now that we know so much more? Right, so, so first thing I'll say is that general relativity has passed every experimental, you know, precision experimental test that has ever been put to it. I mean, so That's it's awesome. really amazing th that this theory that has not been changed or tweaked since 1915 yeah. continues to pass test after test after test. And as we discover new, new objects in the universe, right. even. I mean, you can't even say that about, you know, say the standard model of particle physics. We've had to change it over time by right. adding quarks and color and, and it's very symmetry breaking and so on. It has had to be modified in the face of new data. Yeah. So far, general relativity has passed everything. However, the, the big sort of possible uh, thing on the horizon that general relativity has to confront is the discovery in 1998 that the expansion of the universe is actually accelerating. Okay. Standard general relativity predicts that the expansion should slow down. We know the universe is expanding from some Big Bang. We don't really know and understand what the origin of the Big Bang was, but, but we know it's expanding. <laughs> but gravity attracts, right? So anything that's expanding should slow down because everything is uh, trying to attract itself backwards, exactly. like yeah. throwing a ball in the air. It should slow down and maybe come back to Earth. Yep. Okay. Or maybe continue expanding, but it should definitely slow down to some degree. Mm -hmm. 
That's not what was observed. We see it going faster and faster. It's going faster and faster. And there are a number of probably three current alternatives that people are studying. Okay. One, and the simplest alternative, and it's, it's my favorite, <laughs> I don't, I'm totally happy with this, is to simply add what Einstein added in uh, around 1916 called the cosmological constant. Okay. You can take Einstein's equations and add a term to it without really changing any of its not standard predictions. Okay. But this term has the effect of changing the large-scale behavior of the universe. All right. Einstein originally added this constant because he discovered that in his pure theory of general relativity, the universe had to be expanding or contracting. It could not be static. Okay. Again, because gravity attracts. Right. If, yeah, if so you had a static universe, it would just start to pull itself together. Well, in 1916, the observed universe was static. Right. right? By 1929, Hubble and others had discovered the universe is expanding, mm -hmm. and general relativity. So he introduced the cosmological constant to, sort of to balance. The cosmological constant tends to make the universe accelerate. Okay. So if you put that in, then, then the attraction of gravity could be balanced by this cosmological constant, so he could get a static universe. Okay. That matched observations in that day. Right. By 1929, the universe is then found to be expanding, and Einstein. He later called it his greater, greatest blunder because then he had to drop the cosmological constant. Because that but was to balance it out. To that's make right. It, it wasn't needed anymore, and he said it was my greatest blunder. Well, to get the acceleration of the universe, as observed, you simply reintroduce Einstein's cosmological constant. The value you give it is very different from what Einstein had to. because mm -hmm. it, 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 Well, he was it, trying to balance to be, the universe. It had to be big <laughs> to balance this, but now it can be quite small. Mm -hmm. Pick your value, and you can explain all, all the data. It's perfect. That's great. <laughs> and to me, that's the simplest and most beautiful uh, answer. I regard, this my, from my point of view, we have a number of fundamental constants in nature, mm -hmm. the charge of the electron, Planck's constant, yep. Newton's constant of gravitation, and so on. It's just another There's one. There's another one. And we've now, in the 21st century, reached the stage where we can measure this constant mm -hmm. to some degree of accuracy, right. and we have it and we're done. But that doesn't satisfy everybody. Does not <laughs> satisfy everybody. And, and, I, and I'm totally on board with the, the complaints. Um, especially particle physicists feel that this, this constant should somehow be related maybe to the fundamental structure of, of the vacuum of, mm. of, uh, of space and time. And you ought to be able to calculate that using the principles of quantum mechanics and, and elementary particles. Mm -hmm. The trouble is when you use those principles, you get a value for this cosmological constant that is a, about 125 orders of magnitude larger. So that's 10 to the 125 okay. larger <laughs> than, the, than the value that you put on it to agree with the observations. Okay. So there's this mismatch between sort of the particle mismatch. theory and then the astrophysics observations. And that's right. And it's whatnot. huge. I mean, it's not just like factor of 10. It's right. A, it's 10 a, to the 125. A, it means we, there's something we absolutely don't understand. Okay. And so this has led to the idea of dark energy. Uh, so instead of just having this constant, it may be it's some additional field in the universe. Mm -hmm. And they give it a name dark energy because I think it was invented by Michael Turner of the University of Chicago. But at the moment, it's just a placeholder because we don't really understand it. It's a little bit like Vulcan was. A little bit like Vulcan. In <laughs> fact, it's kind of the same principle. You give a name to something that's kind of, it's a, it characterizes it. it. It's a very good. We can good, talk about it. It's a, it's a nice <laughs> mnemonic for it. Uh, but uh, trying to understand this in, in some fully theoretical way, yeah. and that's been a challenge. So that's kind of the second approach. And there are experiments that are being planned uh, to uh, mainly a satellite experiment to study, tr try to learn a bit more about this dark energy. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it really constant in time, like Einstein's cosmological constant, or does it vary with time? Okay. If it varies with time, that may give us a clue as to what this weird field is that produces this dark energy. Okay. So there are experiments to try to, to do this. Um, 
But then a third possibility is that maybe Einstein's theory needs to re be replaced with a theory that's close to Einstein for all the phenomena that I've been discussing, right. but differs from Einstein on cosmological scales. So a little bit like Newton uh, works for, I guess, solar system scales for the most part, Newton's gravitation. Mm -hmm. Um, Einstein is a little bit bigger, and then now the idea is that maybe there needs to be another That's tweak to make it Another work tweak to make it. And so there's a, a big effort now to produce what are often called uh, modified gravity theories, or beyond Einstein theories, okay. that, um, that you know, can fulfill an accelerating universe, can agree with that, those observations. But then when you look at all the other phenomena are uh, close to you know, the, all the predictions and observations that support general relativity. This task is extremely difficult because it, it turns out, and I have colleagues who work in this area, then mm -hmm. they will tell, they tell me right off the bat, as soon as you try to modify general relativity, it's like, it's like a, a Pandora's box or Medusa <laughs> with the snakes. You cut <laughs> off one and another ugly thing pops out. Oh my out. gosh, yeah, the Hydra. <laughs> it, it's like Hydra, that's right, Hydra. So, um, General relativity is such a natural and perfect theory that modifying it is fraught with uh, difficulties that, uh, that, that pop out and you have, to, you have to push them back in and then another difficulty pops out here, you push it back in and so on. Uh, so it's a very difficult thing to do, uh, just on a theoretical basis, right. but still people are working on it. But then it turned out that when the uh, gravitational waves were detected from the neutron star mm -hmm, right. binary uh, in spiral, and electromagnetic waves were detected from the same source. Right, because we had the multi-messenger detection of these two neutron stars colliding with each other. Right. Yep. So this is the first of these multi-messenger things that will be the wave of the future, uh, yeah, we all we hope. Can, we can use gravitational waves, we can use light waves, we can use... <laughs> exactly right. But what was shown is that uh, because the light signal, the gamma ray bursts, mm -hmm. arrived on th in the solar system within about a second and a half of the gravitational wave burst mm -hmm. from, the, from the same merger, and since the system was uh, uh, 100 plus million light years away, okay. that showed that the speed of gravitational waves and the speed of light are the same to about a part in 10 to the 16. Okay. So to extraordinarily high precision, right. they're the same. And many of these modified gravity theories, in order to, to make predictions on cosmological scales, had to introduce features that caused the speech to be different. Oh, interesting. And so many, though not all, mm -hmm. many of these alternative theories were just wiped out in one fell swoop oh my gosh. by these observations. Okay. So, but, it, of course, it hasn't stopped people because un, un, understanding the acceleration of the universe is a, it's one of the big questions of our day. We have no idea why this is happening, and we really need to understand it. So is, the, is it safe to say that um, with GR, you, know, you can add this co cosmological constant and explain the acceleration of the universe, but we don't really have experimental evidence to exclude the other things that you... Uh, well, now... We some. excluded some of them, but, <laughs> but to exclude sort of the other approaches to gravity. Is that a fair way to say that's it? That's right. But, but again, these all make predictions. You, uh, if, if you have a theory, modified gravity, that satisfies what we now know, and it predicts the acceleration of the universe, mm -hmm. it may predict other things on these large scales that right. differ from standard GR. And then maybe we ex observe something that... And there are uh, experiments, observations being planned, these would be cosmological observations that we can now do with some degrees of precision that can, make, that can possibly sort out the small differences between pure GR and these modified gravity theories mm -hmm. and provide additional tests. But these will all be happening in the future, and so we wait for, you know, wait for you know, the launch of the right missions, the right observations to try to right. test these alternatives. So um, it, as, we, as we start to wrap up, I was wondering a little bit, um, John Wheeler has kind of summarized general relativity as space-time tells matter how to move and matter tells space-time how to curve. Do you have any additional thoughts to add to that sort of very, very short summary of what GR means? Well, no, it's a very nice way to encaps encapsulate uh, uh, what Einstein's theory does and, and, and to distinguish it from Newton's theory. Mm -hmm. Newton's theory says that bodies attract each other because of some action at a distance. Right. Right. 
uh, there's a force between these two bodies that acts on them over some distance. Um, but Einstein's theory fundamentally says that gravity is a result of curvature of space-time, the, the warpage of space and time caused by bodies. Mm -hmm. So bodies warp space-time, and then that space-time, when, when a body passes by a body like the sun, it just follows the undulations of space and time that are, that are presented to it, just the way a car curves on a bank road mm -hmm. because of the, the warpage of the, of the pavement that the car is moving on. You don't even have to turn your steering wheel <laughs> because happens. on a bank road, <laughs> it just happens. Yeah. So, so it, his aphorism really does uh, sum, you know, it up. sum it up. I've heard you describe space-time itself as, as very stiff, I think you said in the past. What, what do you mean by that? So it, it, it really is, it, uh, represents the idea that uh, you have this black, these binary black holes that merged. They emitted an enormous amount of energy. In fact, during the, the two-tenths of a second in the final stage of the merger of the black hole, the energy emitted per unit time in gravitational waves was more than the light energy emitted by all the stars in the observable universe. That's a lot of so For two tenths of a second, it was, oh. in terms of energy output, it was brighter than the entire universe. The power that's coming out is. Power is coming oh out. My gosh. However, that comes out in gravitational waves, which are vibrations of space and time itself. But space time is very stiff, so the vibrations barely make a dent in, in space and time. So those vibrations, as much energy as they were transporting, moved the mirrors of the LIGO gravitational wave detectors by about a thousandth of the diameter of a proton. <laughs> and it's amazing that we were able to detect that. I mean, it's amazing we were able to detect it, but it's just amazing that, yeah. <laughs> that you know, space time doesn't give. So if you it gives can just enough for us to be able to detect it. Just enough, yeah. um, so, so if you could imagine maybe like a, a piece of plastic or something and you were to like try and set up a wave in it and it'd be very, even with a really high energy wave, it's very stiff material and it's not going yeah. to, is that a reasonable? Right, so, so it's not, on, on the other hand, it's not like a, like a floppy trampoline where you right. hit it this way and the trampoline and it just, just goes. goes like that. <laughs> it's really, really stiff. So the response is very small, even though you could have a lot of energy okay. in the waves passing by. That's great. So. Well, um, so now you, this year, were awarded the Albert Einstein Medal. And uh, I wrote down it that specifically it was for important contributions to general relativity, in particular including the post-Newtonian expansions of approximate solutions to the Einstein field equations and their confrontation with experiments. And I was curious, you mentioned kind of joining GR was coming out of being a backwater. Was this at all on the horizon for you getting this medal at, at, at any point in your career? Was it like... Oh yeah, I could I could see this potentially happening one day, or just totally out of sort of. I mean, it was idea. totally out of the blue, and yeah. you know, most most of us don't think think in terms of awards and prizes. Right. I mean, recognition for what you've done is is obviously very great and gratifying, um, but uh, but we don't sort of do what we do uh, in order to to get the recognition. Generally, we do what we do because we just love doing it so much. I guess I guess a better question is. Um, when you, because the Albert Einstein Medal started in the 70s, I believe? 79 was the first 79. award. It was, it was actually, 1979 was the 100th anniversary of Einstein's birth. Okay. And so this foundation in Switzerland, housed in Bern, which is where Einstein was working in 1905 okay. as a patent clerk when he made his famous discoveries of special relativity and contributed to quantum mechanics mm -hmm. and so on. And so they established the award then, and then the first award was to Stephen Hawking. Uh, in 1979, and then it's been given to many, many famous people since then. Right. Um, so I guess maybe my, my better question is um, for the field. Did you see the field having its own award like this? Was that was that at all on the horizon when you were when you were starting out? Was it coming uh, out enough of the backwaters that it was like, oh, maybe someday there could there could be an award that that uh, recognizes uh, these? Right, partly because in those early days the field was still so small right. um, that it wasn't. Uh, took a long time to be recognized as a, as a sort of a, a field, a co-equal field of physics, along with you know, nuclear physics, particle physics, condensed matter physics. Right. Um, it took a lot of time. And, but through the efforts of the, the growing community of gravitational physicists that, that really began in the 70s and continues to today, um, you know, we've helped to establish this field as a, as a branch. I mean, so for example, uh, early on, uh, 
I'd have to, I forget the exact year, but a, a group within the American Physical Society, a topical group on gravitation was oh, established okay. yeah. to bring together people in this field who are interested. But today it has now grown to be a division of oh, wow. the APS. Yeah. So, uh, so it's large enough now to be a full-fledged division along with the other major divisions of the field. Um, well, I'm just thinking about the collaborations for LIGO and Virgo and LISA, hopefully. They're just gigantic. They're gigantic, <laughs> so there are many people there are a part of, the, of this division. And similar divisions have been created in other societies, like the, uh, the German Physical Society, European Physical Society, and so on. Um, and again, about, uh, must be pushing 20 years ago, the APS established the Einstein Prize. Okay. Yep. To recognize uh, achievements in, in gravitational physics. So, as a field, we have grown and uh, are now being recognized uh, as a, you know, as a field with all the, the things that go along with being a full-fledged field. But when I started in uh, 1968, astronomers scoffed at black holes, <laughs> never thought they'd be interesting. <laughs> Particle physicists weren't at all interested in general relativity. Now, you know, there's a whole field of string theory that's you know, really talks about the interface between general relativity and fundamental particle physics. Well, so like astroparticle physics is kind of its own. There's astroparticle yeah. physics. So, <laughs> it, you know, we're now, we've, we've, we've now, you know, come into our own as, yeah. a, as a field, yeah. which is very different from, what, from when I started out. It must have been so exciting. To kind it was of very exciting. It's just, I've, I've, yeah. I've, I've just had a, a, a fantastically fun career doing work that, uh, and for me, I think it's been especially rewarding since I work at, the, at the boundary between theory and experiment. Mm. I like to work on general relativity and do calculations that, that then allow predictions to be made that allow experimentalists or observers to observe. Right. And to, to do this and then have things actually be observed that agree with what, uh, what you calculated, to me that's the most rewarding thing of all. It must feel great when that happens. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, there's a lot of, of jargon wrapped up in the award, you know, this description of um, post-Newtonian expansions of approximate solutions, the Einstein field equations, and then, of course, you mentioned the, the confrontation with experiments. If you were going to describe your research to a fifth grader, what would you say? Well, um, so general relativity is very complicated theory, mathematically. Um, but for uh, many situations, its predictions are not very different from Newtonian theory, which okay. is a much simpler theory. And so this award mentioned post-Newtonian approximations. We have been able to develop a way to uh, approx find approximate solutions of Einstein's complicated equations um, that, uh, that can be improved step by step to become more and more accurate. Okay. You never get a perfectly exact solution, but you get one that's iterate. closer and closer to the true solution. But these then can be f formulated in a way that uh, are very practical. Okay. It can so be it used can to use predict them. like how a spacecraft would move as it goes toward the sun in enough detail that you could measure the tiny effects. Okay. Or to predict how two black holes will orbit each other very accurately. And so you can measure and see if that agrees with the observations. And it turns out that the predictions made from this theory and from other work for the waves detected by LIGO, both in the discovery and in the detection since, they all work. So in That's thinking about um, Einstein's field equations, I imagine a lot of people sort of imagine when they think of an equation, it, you know, kind of maybe they think of an equation and the solution is sort of overlapping a little bit and like, oh, it's, it's been figured out. Einstein wrote his theory. But what you're kind of describing is like, well, the field equations actually are, are about relationships between different uh, aspects of the universe, mm -hmm. and you have to go and do a solution for a specific situation to, to actually see what would happen, and that, that that's part of why there's no um, it's precise, that, that why you end up doing these sort right. of iterating upon getting a better and better solution. Is that right? I mean, all the, all the fundamental equations of physics are like this. These are equations, they're technically, they're differential equations, right? They're, they're a set of equations that are, that but you, you can't do anything until you've solved those equations. So there's two things. That you have the equations and there are the solutions that, that, are, that work in whatever physical situation you're, 
you're presented with. So I guess uh, maybe the way to say it, differential equations for like the, the lay person maybe is um, it's an equation that is telling you how things are changing in time or changing in space. Changing in space. And your job as a theorist is to figure out what that change then is, <laughs> essentially. That's or right. what, it, what it might be. Uh, That's right. And then hopefully experimentalists can go and, and yep. look at that. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for uh, talking with me today. This has just been a great conversation. I really appreciate it. Okay, thank you. It's been a pleasure.